Hi, it's Mark Owen from Moose Marketing PR, the editor of Punchline magazine. Welcome to Punchline Talks. Today I'm joined by Richard Cook, the leader of the Gloucester City Council uh, and uh, a councillor for Kingsway for the past five years. Welcome to Punchline Talks, Richard. Thank you, Mark. I'm pleased to be here. Yeah, thanks ever so much for joining us. The thing about you, if you don't mind me saying, mate, is that lots of people, you know, you've been a, a councillor for five years, but you've actually only been leader for 15 months. My goodness, what are 15 months you've chosen to, to be? I, I know, if you don't mind me saying, you didn't really want to be the leader. Is that is that an understatement or, you know? Very much so. I mean, um, you mentioned that I've been councillor for uh, for five years. And uh, before that, um, I'd um, to do something, I'd actually been a, a co-opted councillor on Quedgley Parish Council for a, for a period of a year. And it was during that period that I was approached by a councillor who was on cabinet in the city councillor, who said to me, um, would you consider joining uh, joining the council? Because we recognise that you're involved in provide, uh, in helping uh, with residents' issues. We think you would be appropriate to stand in Kingsway where you live, uh, because Kingsway is, for the first time, going to be a ward in its own right. So, um, you know, I wondered, what, what, why did I want to be a councillor? And uh, I thought, well, it's something back to society, um, a society that I've worked in for years. I live here in the ward. I want to see residence issues be dealt with. And I thought, OK, I'll ask the question, what's the level of work? And he said, oh, he said nothing much. He said a couple of hours here, a couple of hours there, you know, read this report, attend this meeting. You know, the usual stuff when people want to recruit you to do a job that's going to be difficult and awkward. Um, and um, I, I agreed when I was reassured that there wasn't much work involved, you know, that I could uh, uh, just help my residents out. So I stood uh, next to um, uh, Jenny Watkins, and you know Jenny, she's uh, been a councillor for 10, 12 years, done an absolutely amazing job in terms of uh, helping out communities and neighbourhoods. Uh, and, you know, on the very first day that I met her, we were going to do some canvassing in Kingsway for the very first time back in, oh, 20, it would be late December in 2015, I think. And she said to me, why do you want to do this job? What are your ambitions? So I said, Jenny, at my age, all I want to do is give a little back. I don't have any ambitions. I don't want to, um, I don't want to go very far. I just want to be able to give a little bit back to my community. Well, you know the story from there. I got elected. And uh, some four or five months after I'd been elected, uh, my predecessor as cabinet member for environment, who was a gentleman called um, Jim Porter, he unfortunately died. He'd had cancer for some period and um, uh, he died. And I was then asked, um, well, we were invited to um, apply to replace him as, uh, uh, as a cabinet member for environment. And I thought, well, I hadn't done very much in the four or five months that I've been uh, in uh, on council. I'm on the planning committee and I don't really like that because I don't know that much about planning, despite having, uh, having had a little bit of um, training, which was not great training. It was good enough so that we could stand on that planning uh, uh, or sit on that planning committee, but I don't really enjoy it. And I thought if I get onto cabinet, then I can do something that I'm interested in working on the on environmental issues. So I applied for it, uh, knowing that a lot of the work was going to be around sorting out the problems that we had with Amy. And I had a contract management background. Um, so I, I took the opportunity of reading the contract uh, uh, that we had with Amy and thought, what an absolute shambles is this contract? I thought there's no enforceable key performance indicators, no penalties in the event that they fail, no way for us to get out of that contract um, except by going to court. I thought, what a shambles. What are we going to do about this? And um, surprisingly, uh, bearing in mind that um, one of the other persons who was also applying for this job had previously had it, the cabinet selected me to be cabinet member for environment. And then you know there's a whole new story. There's um, the arguments that we had with Amy about what was right and what was wrong with the contract, about what they could do to improve it, about the fights that we had 
2,000 missing tons, you'll probably recall from uh, three, uh, three years ago, where they apparently lost loads of recycling. And the contract was a shambles, but we did an awful lot of work. Officers particularly got, uh, they mucked in and really got to work with Amy and I helped where I was able to, and we actually turned it around. We turned around a contract that was not performing into a contract that arguably now is very good. It works very well. They do, a, 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 you know, I know that you're never going to get every piece of litter off the ground. I know that not every blade of grass is going to be mowed into one inch lengths. I know that flower beds are sometimes going to get weeds in. I know that people's bins are sometimes going to be missed. All of these things are possible in a contract like this. It's a huge contract. But you know what? If you look at bin misses where people's bins have not been collected, it runs at something like 99.98%. Uh, that's pretty good. That's a pretty good total. 56,000 bins every week emptied for 99.98%. Um, uh, you know, say it's, it, it could it could be better, yes, but uh, you know that's only about fifty bins a week that are missed, and quite often that's because residents have put them out too late and then complain that they haven't been picked up because Amy have already been and gone, been and gone, not been and gone. How much? Sorry, a long <laughs> statement. I didn't mean to be quite that lengthy. I'll let you come in with another question. No, 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 not at all. Actually, how much was the contract worth worth for Amy? Well, we earn money from it as well through things like uh, reselling, um, recycling products and uh, from bulky waste and uh, things like that. So if you offset one against the other, it's probably somewhere around about five and a half million pounds per year. So a big, big contract. Is it five year contract? Yeah. It started off in 2007, the beginning of 2007, and it will be ending next year. So it's a 15 year contract. Uh, and have Amy got it again or is it? No. no, Amy have actually, um, Amy are in the process of being taken over by Urbasa, uh, the, and uh, that is happening as we speak. Uh, but when the contract is renewed next year, we will be leaving Amy uh, or Urbasa as they'll be then and um, joining Ubico. Okay, well, let's move on. Let's so, move on from that. Yeah. So, so you became a, the... Uh, I was going to say minister, but you came the, um, the, the cabinet, cabinet charge of your cabinet member for um, the environment. How did you become leader of the city council? Well, that was another set of errors, really. Um, I think uh, Paul was looking to stand down uh, because he didn't want to stand again from uh, May 2020. <coughs> so uh, I'd just been on a training course on um, on leadership and um, leadership skills, and I got back from that, and he said to me, uh, well, how would you like to take over as leader? And uh, and I thought, oh, hang on, you know, I've only just had this training course, um, and I, you know, I've only been in this job three and a half years, and you're asking me to be leader already. Uh, and I thought, no, this is not something that I want to do. But as I looked around, there was there wasn't, there wasn't very much other choice about, uh, you know, amongst people who actually wanted to do the job. There were probably one or two who could do it better than I did, but they actually also had their own reasons why they didn't want to take over. So I was kind of left in a position, if not me, just who? And there wasn't anybody else. And I just felt that somebody, somebody had to do it. And I didn't think it was going to be very long, you know, um, but uh, here I am 15 months later and, uh, um, people like you are very kindly saying I'm doing a great job. I don't know why, but um, uh, it's it's really been hard work. It's really been hard work, and um, uh, it's been an enormous period of growth for me because I've had so much to learn going on. And throughout that period, as you well know, through most of that period, we've had COVID, and it's been absolutely awful trying to pilot a way through it. Government um, not perhaps being as generous as they might. Uh, might, or we might have assumed their promises were. Uh, so we've been looking at how much money we're going to have to save going forward. But um, simply getting the volunteers together, and there, and, and there again, I have to look at the, the volunteers around the city, particularly Jenny Watkins again, who I would say has done an amazing job of getting together those communities to look after themselves in what is 
really difficult times. The food consortium that she was involved in setting up, the distribution of food to where it was needed around the city through, especially through the first lockdown when things were so difficult. Uh, absolutely amazing job. And I think one of the things about leadership is recognizing skills that you have amongst the people who, who are there with you. People like Jenny Watkins, who has done just that amazing job. Uh, and uh, I suppose I'm lucky that, uh, that I've had her. She could have left in, um, you know, in May last year as well. In fact, she was originally intending to, uh, but she stayed with us and she, as I say, she's done that great, great job. I mean, it's a big shoes to fill for, you know, for Jenny, because obviously she's uh, going to Swansea. And um, yeah, uh, who's, who's set to replace her? That's completely undecided yet because we don't know. We've, we're all going to be elected in May uh, or all going to uh, uh, undergo elections in May, if that, uh, uh, for want of a better word. So we have to see who there is. <clears throat> I don't know now until uh, until we know who's elected. It might I might not be uh, uh, leading the administration after the elections. It might uh, it might be somebody else. Um, so I'm uh, I'm I've got my eye on a few people. But I don't know whether it'll be me who's pointing to them. Let's go back, to, if you don't mind me saying, to your earlier career. So what did you do before you, you were a councillor or before you retired? I'm assuming you're, you're retired now anyway. I am retired. Uh, my wife and I chose to, um, uh, we lived in Reading. And in uh, 20, late 2012, we decided we were going to retire early and uh, sell the house uh, that we owned in uh, Reading. Uh, which was relatively expensive by uh, um, uh, you know because it's in the southeast move here 70 miles to gloucester where we were uh, able to buy a very much nicer house uh, and put uh, 100,000 pounds in the bank to fund our early retirement <coughs> so that was 2013 when we moved here um, 2016 when i joined the council so you can tell a number of years had gone by uh, and i've been doing pretty much gardening or actually digging out the garden. I did uh, try for a while working for Asda because we had a new Asda just down the road from us, but uh, that was um, that was challenging, getting up uh, for a six o'clock start every morning. I'm uh, not known for as being somebody who gets up that early. Um, I know my predecessor did, Paul. He, uh, he was always up around about six o'clock doing, uh, sending out emails at six in the morning, but not me. You'll, uh, you'll find me still happily asleep at that time. Um, but yeah, I worked for Asda for, a, for about a year. And we also took a lot of time to be tourists. And uh, <coughs> there's a lot of lovely countryside around here, lots of lovely places to visit. And Gloucester itself has lots of um, interesting and inspiring places to, uh, 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 to be tourists at. So we enjoyed that for, uh, for several years. Before I retired, I had a, uh, a vending business. Um, that uh, um, owned and uh, supplied vending machines down the M4 corridor, all the way from Reading down into uh, West London, Brentford area. Um, and I had several hundred of those, which I supplied, maintained, filled uh, with the vending products. Uh, and that was a business that um, um, once, once I'd uh, sold it, made it possible to uh, uh, retire early. <coughs> Before that, I'd had a doll's house shop selling all things um, that you put into uh, little dolls' houses, all one twelfth scale. And uh, that unfortunately uh, started off really, really well. Um, but um, we had, uh, we had a, a period of uh, the Chinese getting involved in it and manufacturing, mass producing the stuff that we were getting manufactured by, or made by hand by people who enjoyed making these little things, including me, wasn't very good at it, but, uh, uh, I was doing that sort of thing as well. But uh, after we'd run it for about three years, we really started struggling because uh, people weren't prepared to pay 10 pounds, for example, for a, a small light fitting that would go into a doll's house when they could buy them from other companies which were importing mass, uh, mass produced products in China and selling them for a pound. Why pay 10 pounds when you can get the same thing for one pound, but it's mass produced. So um, that business was, um, that business failed in the end because uh, um, uh, it was unsustainable when we couldn't produce at the same price that the Chinese were uh, importing them into this country. 
And before that, I used to work for uh, American Airlines and I worked for them for uh, about 13 years. Uh, my final job there for 12 of the 13 years was uh, as uh, uh, the uh, manager of purchasing for uh, the international division, which meant that I was responsible for everything that we bought outside of the Americas, uh, North and South America. So whether it was in Australia or whether it was Japan or whether it was Europe or Africa, I was responsible for all the purchasing in, the, in, in those areas. And before that, I worked in a variety of jobs for TWA, who were taken over by American Airlines in uh, 1990. Uh, and I won't go to my career before TWA because it was fairly insignificant and I was quite young in those days. So uh, that's a potted version of my uh, my uh, uh, business. Well, lots of lots of lots of experience there. I mean, I can see I can see why you, you'd worked out that the Amy contract wasn't fit for purpose if you were you know dealing with major purchasing for uh, American Airlines. Yeah, I mean, not only not only major purchasing, but I was also responsible for all of their um, uh, facilities management in the UK. So every building that American owned, whether it was at Glasgow or Birmingham or Gatwick or Heathrow, all those came under my responsibility as well. And you can you'd be aware of dealing with that. I'd be dealing with lots and lots of contracts um, uh, with lots and lots of different suppliers. So I knew my contract management stuff. And once reading that uh, that tomb which uh, or that tome which was uh, uh, the uh, uh, the amy contract uh, which took all summer because it was five thousand digital pages of stuff it was an awful lot of stuff to read uh, but i could see why it was not really going to be beneficial to the council to be working that uh, using that contract it was clearly written by accord who um, uh, who we originally contracted with it wasn't written by the council there weren't any ad adaptations that I could see in there where the council would have said, this is the way to do it. They'd just taken an off the shelf package from, uh, from Accord and said, this will, this is fine. Well, it wasn't, it wasn't. And that's why we ended up with the problems that we had. So who was, who was in charge of the original contract? I think, it, I don't know, officers would have brought in that original contract. Um, I don't know who was uh, in charge back in the day when it was all being worked up. I think that might have been a change of uh, uh, change of um, a change of member around about the time, and I think it probably just um, uh, fell between the cracks. It was all rushed, hurried, and uh, uh, as a consequence, we ended up with a contract that I felt was unfit for purpose. Of course, I have that background. Other members might not. You, know, you can't expect members to be reading 5,000 digital pages of uh, contract um, and understanding it. It's a huge, huge job to do that. That's officers' jobs to do that. And uh, I don't think officers at that time did a good enough job. Well, we could we could talk about marketing gloss because that leads on to contracts and all the things. That, but let's be honest about this. We agreed not to talk about it because there's still an investigation going on by the police. Before we agreed this interview, we agreed not to talk about it because, uh, well, we felt it's the best way to go. But that's OK. Uh, but I do feel that it's worth mentioning that we're not talking about it. Well, uh, I think people would probably be surprised at us, Mark, if we do talk about it. But I think the point that you've made is that it is still subject to police investigation. And uh, I don't want to muddy that police investigation by saying things which uh, uh, might actually prejudice the work that they're doing. Uh, and uh, there is lots to say about it, but um, I think that has to be another time. Uh, I'm not going to uh, try and point any fingers at anybody at the moment. Let's let the police do their work. OK, let's, uh, let's just put that to one side. Now, now, as leader of the City Council, what's been the most difficult part of dealing with the COVID crisis since you've been in charge? Um, I think the unexpectedness of all of the situation, of everything around us, the difficulties we found that uh, suddenly, literally hundreds of homes were finding themselves unable to supply themselves with food anymore. I think that was probably the biggest surprise of all. Why did that happen just because we were in lockdown? And I guess there was a, a, a whole lot of reasons why. Some people had, you know, found themselves without their jobs anymore. Um, people who were, um, previously self-employed perhaps, 
who weren't able to go out and do any work. There were people who were self-isolating and they, uh, they weren't allowed to go to the shops or they were told it was unsafe to go to the shops and they weren't able to order food from the shops because the shops hadn't got themselves sorted out in terms of uh, providing food to those at greatest need. So getting all of that, um, uh, getting the whole city to work together distributing leaflets around the whole city, ensuring that people knew who to contact when they needed help. That was, uh, that was a tremendously difficult time. But again, I go back to what I said, it was uh, Jenny Watkins who was the largest organizer of that. And I think those people who were involved in that group know that and, uh, and respect her for it. But she's now working on uh, trying, to, uh, trying to recognize all the individuals who were involved in those groups, whether it be, um, um, people like Justin Hudson in the uh, in Butler's who used his premises, couldn't use them as a nightclub because they were all shut down, but he used them to store and distribute food from. Amazing, amazing work. People like uh, Hash Norat, who with Gloucester Feed the Hungry, was actually still trying to supply food uh, all around the city. And there are lots of others. Jenny Leahy with the Court Association in Tuffley, um, Ross Nickel with... Uh, um, uh, with his organization also in the Tuffley area, I think we have a huge amount of uh, support from uh, from the communities. But I, again, I, I say it was down to Jenny to bring all that community support together and provide us with the way uh, that we successfully um, delivered help to people who needed it in the city. Now that we come out of that first lockdown, I, I think it's... The only thing I, the only thing I look at at the moment as being really difficult is trying to, uh, uh, trying to learn all that I need to learn, because there are so many other subjects that we talk about. We might talk later about what's been going on at, um, at the the old tip in Hempstead, um, uh, and it does require a lot of learning to understand what they're what they're doing there. Uh, what. Um, I mean, there's issues re relating to Aspire Trust, you know, at GL One. What are we going to do there about supporting them when they can't have people in there uh, and have to stay closed? There are all sorts of issues that uh, surround COVID, but it's a learning curve to decide what, what I can do uh, to be useful in helping them. I mean, there's, there are some big projects. Let's be honest, but let's try and be positive here. Um, we've got the Gloucester Forum. There's the train station. There's the new medical centre by the prison. There's the Hartbury university or college um, um, student accommodation that's going up as well. There's the hotel that's possibly going to be put in place by the docks, the old uh, uh, Herbert warehouse. There's still development going on on the other side of the docks. What's the most, what's the, what's the one development or regeneration that really gets you excited about? Uh, it can't just be the forum. Well, it, it actually is the one that I find most exciting because it's by far the biggest, and which, as you know, is already proceeding in terms of the um, uh, redevelopment of King Square. That hopefully will be delivered later on this year. The forum, of course, is, uh, is coming up. We're going to be doing that in stages, uh, but that's £107 million pounds worth of, uh, of uh, redevelopment going on right there in several plots. Uh, across the road from that, there's the railway station redevelopment and that uh, awful underpass um, uh, which has got to be uh, uh, reconstructed in some way so that whole patch there um, is going to be is something that I find most exciting but yeah you mentioned about the HKP warehouses uh, to, in the docks where the council used to um, uh, have its offices that's um, um, in the final stages of, um, of legals at the moment uh, and then hopefully and I'm hoping that it will all take place this year uh, transfer of ownership will go to um, Dowdswell and Dowdswell will start, uh, come forward with plans uh, for how they're going to redevelop it. And once those plans are approved, then they pay us for the uh, uh, for the properties and just get on with it. So uh, obviously their interest is going to be uh, once they've got those plans approved. And we're hoping that's going to be later on this year. Uh, they'll move quickly to actually uh, start getting their money back because they have to pay us before they do that development. Uh, and that uh, would encourages them to uh, get it developed as quickly as possible. Uh, beyond beyond HKP, you mentioned, of course, the other side of the docks, um, Provender Mill, uh, where Rokeby Merchant are still um, 
planning out how they're going to finish off the remaining parts of that area. Uh, it might need some more money put into that, uh, but we'll have to wait and see. They've done a great job so far with the 47 flats that they put in there, the new hotel, uh, the harvester, um, and all the other development that's gone on in that area. It's just got to be um, pushed a little bit harder to get the rest of it over the line. And coming back into the city centre, of course, you've got the fleece, which we're hoping will start work soon. Um, the uh, uh, Dowds will have already taken on one of the, uh, the, um, the retail units at the front, which they'll use for capturing information about what, what that area used to look like in years gone by. And they're planning a uh, pop-up um, food and beverage outlet at the back in the old car park. And that will start to show that they have an interest in the site. And ultimately, we hope to be able to bring that one forward as well. Again, all these, uh, lots of these areas suffer viability issues. There isn't enough money uh, to, to make it work. So we have to get grants in from other people. We are looking at those uh, options uh, all the time to see where we can get that additional money from, whether it be Homes England or um, uh, BEIS or uh, uh, MHCLG. Uh, or other government bodies. So all of those people have to be constantly talked to, as does the MP, because uh, he's always very useful at trying to bring additional money into Gloucester and helping us when he recognises that there are important ways forward and uh, uh, in terms of regeneration. Now, the Fleece Hotel, funny you mentioned the Fleece Hotel, because aren't, aren't Dowswell, is there £2 million worth of grant going into the Fleece? Uh, I don't know that they put any money into it yet, but they will do at some stage in the future when uh, uh, when we move uh, into uh, greater activity in that area. But it will take time. Can't expect everything to happen all at the same time. There is capacity limitations, both in terms of people like uh, Dowswell and in terms of the council being able to work with them. What about uh, the um, the Green Eco Park that was um, we, we've done a story <coughs> on it recently? Can you tell us your, your input into that? I know you're, you're big on the environment, obviously, you mentioned that earlier. Yeah, Richard, Richard Graham and I have been working on this for two years now, um, working with Enova, who own that site. Um, their job is to restore that site so that it becomes, um, so that it's not a tip anymore. They have a number of such sites around the country. There are around the whole country there are some 2,000 former landfill sites that need to be restored in this way and Enovert have I think 13 of them, this is just one of them and their plans to put in 100,000 trees, uh, two lots of um, um, 8,000 solar panels, uh, possibly put in wind turbines when the planning is right, when the planning applications can go through and I think they're very difficult at the moment doing um, um, uh, land-based um, wind turbines but ultimately if we get that successfully working we're, we've even been talking about uh, doing a hydrogen production area up there and that hydrogen will be very important in terms of powering off uh, our uh, vehicle fleets going forward. I heard um, before the weekend that there isn't enough lithium in the entire world to supply batteries for the British fleet of vehicles. So if that's possible, if, that, if it's impossible even to get the British fleet of vehicles all electric, which is something that we're targeting for 2030, how on earth are we going to do that? We can't do it with electricity or with battery powered vehicles, so we're going to have to find other ways of doing it. And hydrogen is one of those ways forward. And that's very, very possible with cheap renewable energy, either from solar or from wind, um, to uh, to make hydrogen for us. And then we've got ready customers around the city. We've got Stagecoach who might power their buses with hydrogen. You can't power a bus with a battery when it's got to do a 150 mile journey in a day because the batteries don't exist that will, will do that. So it's got to be hydrogen powered. And then how many logistics companies are there around here? Well, you know, um, there are loads of di different logistics companies who could all power their um, uh, their lorry fleets using hydrogen because they do you know hundreds of miles every day and again the battery capacity isn't there so we need to look at different ways hydrogen is just one of those and if we can crack that one brilliant that's a way forward and um, <clears throat> at some stage in the future all those 
dirty gas boilers that we all have in our homes nowadays, giving us heat in the winter time, they're all going to have to be replaced because the carbon production of those gas boilers just has to be re replaced with something renewable. And it's possible to change that to hydrogen. It's also possible to change them for ground source heat pumps or for air source heat pumps. All those options have to be looked at. And it's a, it's a huge, great big challenge for the forward, uh, for the future, which we're already looking at now. Richard, we're fast. We're fast, unfortunately, running out of time. And I know we could talk for a lot more. Um, and I've got so many other questions, but a couple of ones I'm just going to finish off with, that, if that's OK. Uh, first thing of all is your top three business tips. Now, normally, normally I do prep people or just ask them beforehand, can you think of their top three business tips? I, I saw, but I haven't done that with you today. Could you give us your top three business tips, please? Put your I'm only going to give you... Mark, I'm only going to give you one because there is only really one. <clears throat> if you're a manager, look after your people. If you look after your people, they'll look after the business for you. That's always worked for me. I think it's powerful advice to give to any manager. Look after your people and they'll look after the business for you. So that's the only one I would actually say. On a personal level, what's the latest book you're reading? Um, I don't know. It's some uh, it's some trashy science fiction at the moment. I, I don't know the, the title of the book. <laughs> Fair enough. Richard Cook, leader of Gloucester City Council. Thanks ever so much for talking to Punchline Talk. Always good to see you, Richard. Thank you. OK, thank you, Mark.